So yesterday you heard um, a lot of talks on, cr on uh, chronography and adaptive optics. And in particular, I was struck by a statement by Jeremy that he said, resolution is not the problem. It's contrast that's the problem. And that's, of course, spoken by someone who is given a certain uh, size aperture. I think we would all prefer to have bigger apertures and better resolution if we could. But it's true that at some point you're limited by diffraction and your resolution can't be improved until you focus on the contrast. But so this talk is going to focus on when you have to give up on chronography, give up on adaptive optics, and you really have to go close into the central core of something, and you can't uh, separate the light so easily, what you might do. And so instead of getting rid of the photons, you have to instead try to calibrate the photons. And so this whole, the theme of this talk really is to introduce interferometric techniques, which have the advantage of sometimes being able to control your aperture and controlling your calibration process so that you can, do a, you can do the best job possible given your photon noise limit. You still can't get around the photon noise limit, like you, so you'd like to get rid of the photons if you could. Um, there is a technique called nulling interferometry, which is the ki kind of the equivalent of chronography for interferometers, but that's, we're going to have a talk on the LBTI and there's gonna, by uh, Denis Defrayer, and he's going to kind of bring in the nulling aspects of interferometry, but today I'm just going to talk about uh, sort of interferometry uh, more basic. So probably many of you uh, know the idea. Uh, in this talk, I'll be focusing a fair amount of my uh, slides on non-redundant aperture masking because that has become more topical and relevant in the exoplanet area. In fact, I'm, I'm mainly going to focus on the exoplanet or young pro accreting planet topics. I'm not going to talk about a lot of the results in long baseline interferometry on sort of the younger disks before this, which are more about the initial conditions of planet formation. I'm going to really try to only focus on applications that are on the planets or really the accreting planets. So as you know, if you have a single aperture of diameter d, you have the diffraction limit. And, but of course, there's nothing magic about having all that piece of glass be continuous. If you start to break up your piece of glass, you get something that might look a bit like the Giant Magellan Telescope here or part of the LBT. LBTI, and, uh, and there you, you, you have what we talk about as the maximum baseline between your apertures, and you can still talk about the diameter, but now it's the diameter of your individual apertures or your telescopes. And so you can, the diffraction limit of the combined system, if you're able to coherently combine the light together, is of course lambda over your baseline now, not lambda over your individual telescopes. And of course we can just keep taking that to an extreme and make them smaller and smaller. Same idea. Now, what happens with an interferometer if you take two separate telescopes, you know, with the Young's two-slit experiment, you've seen some of these graphs. Instead of a single aperture, which you saw yesterday, you have now the two apertures with the separated by a distance. You get interference fringes where the overall extent of your pattern, sorry, is there a laser? Oh, yeah. The overall extent of your pattern um, has to do with the... Um, so I didn't go there. Sorry, I did the other way around. The, uh, the, the distance between the peaks in your pattern, your interference fringes, of, is related to the separation of your slits, while the extent of your pattern is the uh, lambda over your individual aperture. So again, you know that if you block one of the apertures, you would just get a broad pattern. You block the other one, you get the broad pattern. You open them both up, and you see the, the, the electric fields interfering, right? Oh, so just introduce the idea. This is sometimes called the primary beam of your interferometer because, because there, there is this overall extent of the fringes. If you, had, if you have an object that's very far away from your main object, it won't make it into your system or it won't interfere at least easily with other, other sources in your, uh, in your field of view because of this effect. So I'm not going to derive the Van Zitter Zernicke theorem in interferometry for, for time, and just to, I think it's more important here, since most of you don't work with interferometers, to at least get the spirit of what they're useful for, because there, it turns out there are a lot of facilities that have, for instance, aperture mass in them that you can apply for time on. So it's more important, I think, here for you to get the spirit of it, and then you can dig into the math on your own time or ask me any questions. But the basic idea is that the, the uh, strength of your interference at your center of your interferometer, at the, what we call the zero delay, is going to be related to um, where the object is in your field of view. So if your object is centered in your, field of, in your field of view of your interferometer, you get one, you get the maximum constructive interference. And as you would move this source delta away from your line of sight or your, where you call the center of the phase of your interferometer, it will get modulated up and down, up and down uh, as, it, as you change the relative path lengths through your interferometer. Now, that and the, and the amount, the, the speed that it gets modulated has to do with the baseline in units of your wavelength. So this is the projected baseline, 
um, divided by the lambda, so the number of uh, the length of your baseline in units of wavelength. Now, if you, you can tell that this modulation of a cosine is reminiscent of a Fourier transform. And so this, the, the amount of interference that your interferometer measures is called the visibility. And you can, you can see that if you just imagine putting lots of sources across your field of view, if they're all incoherent with each other, which they would be, you can just do the integral. So it's just this integral of the point source response function over your, over your field of view with the intensity that your object has. And so this is indeed the real part of a Fourier transform. And so this is the, uh, this is the Van Zernicki theorem, that the visibility that you measure in interferometer is directly a one Fourier component of the image that you're seeing. So it's kind of a big reduction of information, right? You have this whole complex image with who knows what's in it, planets, disks, you know, jets, whatever might be in it. You, once you, if you put just a two aperture interferometer, you measure the interference, you get basically two numbers out, an amplitude and a phase of, what, of, your, of your fringe, and that's not much information, right, compared to the image, which may have hundreds of pixels across it. So you have to combine many different baseline configurations, different angles on the sky, different separations, so that you can then do an inversion, a Fourier transform inverse, so that you can get the image back, essentially. So the point, if you want to do true imaging uh, with an interferometer, you need many, many baselines so that you can invert the problem. I mean, you'll, I'll go through some basic principles, but it should make sense that if you have 100 independent sort of things going on in your image, you need at least 100 individual baselines, right, to get at it from just an information theory perspective, and of course, usually more because you don't get the right ones. Now, for an exoplanet case where you're looking at often a source surrounded by maybe a point source or one object, if it's, like say, an accreting object or if it's an exoplanet, you actually don't need to do the full imaging problem because you have a simpler situation. And in fact, what you'll see mostly today is not imaging per se, but it's uh, model fitting to a binary model or to a simple model. That's a more optimal way to get at it. So just to show some examples, if you have a source coming in, um, Look at the black line. This is one object. It creates the black interference fringe here. You have another object at some, let's say, a planet, or in this case, a binary star, I suppose, off center, say, from a little bit. It would come through the same system and make the same pattern, but it would be shifted over by some phase. When you, what the interferometer measures, of course, is the combination. And so we would see this fringe, and we would say it has a visibility of 70%. That's compared to a full modulation. And it has a phase shift, which you could visually see here, whatever it is here, 10 degrees or something, 20 degrees. And that would be our observable that the interferometer does. If, if you, for instance, had an object at exactly half of lambda over d in angle, then that's, our, that's half our fringe frequency. And that puts them exactly out of phase. And you, an interferometer would measure nothing. It would just look like light. there's an incoherent light because they're exactly about out of phase with each other, the two, uh, the two stars. And indeed, as I said, just to repeat these basics, the amplitude of that fringe is your Fourier amplitude of that single component. And the phase is your Fourier phase. So it's, it's actually very simple. Um, so as you, as you might guess from this example, an ex a binary star has a very simple visibility curve with radius, or with baseline rather, when they're, if the two components, um, if you, as you resolve your baseline, they start out unresolved, which gives you a unity visibility. Remember, um, a Fourier transform of delta function is just unity everywhere in the Fourier plane. And, but as you resolve it, they start to destructively, in a sense, beat against each other. And then you go down to here where you get that zero, which I showed you. That's when it's exactly at half lambda over the baseline. And then it comes back up. And, in, and in, if, they're, if they're point sources, they go, it goes all the way back up to one again. And it repeats until you resolve the star itself. If, if they're not equal binaries, you see what happens is you start at one. But because one fringe is bright, the other fringe is smaller. When they're destructively interfering, they can't completely cancel each other out. And so you get a lower visibility, but not totally to, to, to zero. And so of course, by characterizing these curves, which may only take a couple of data points, you can do a model fit and figure out your binary separation, flux ratio, orientation on the sky. Um, in, a, in a more complex case, you may ha also have extended emission. So Fourier transforms are linear. You know, always remember that about Fourier transforms. So things, that, if you think of individual components in the image space, you can they add up, and so the Fourier transforms also add up. If they have a center of symmetry, then they just literally add up. Otherwise, of course, you have to take into account their complex numbers. So, uh, for example, here's a visibility curve of a disk, a star with a disk. At, again, at zero baseline, it's unresolved. As you resolve it, you first resolve the disk, because it's the largest thing. 
then you, it oscillates a little bit because of its ring-like structure, and then it would asymptote out. And the level at which it asymptotes is telling you the fraction of, that, of the light that's coming from your star, the unresolved object. And of course, the, uh, the other part of it is the dust shell. And if you were to measure that, you would get the size of your dust shell. So again, if you aren't interested in imaging or you don't have enough data for imaging, you can still do a lot of science by fitting to these functional forms if you hopefully know something about your object. So this is relevant, and part of my talk I'm going to mention debris disks, because one area interferometers have made some progress is measuring very faint contributions from debris disks around, around stars uh, that are related, so it's related to planet formation, of course. So that's measuring this, this drop-off in the visibility here um, in an interferometer. Now what makes, um, now I said you need Fourier phases and Fourier amplitudes to do a Fourier transform, but unfortunately the atmosphere corrupts uh, Part of the part of this information. So this is actually what a, a Kolmogorov turbulence looks like around a, a, just a 10 meter aperture around the of size of the Keck telescope. And uh, you know these rad these uh, contours are one radian of phase delay uh, at two microns. So this is if you look at the characteristic distance between contours, that's R naught, right? That's your your coherence length of the atmosphere, and that tells you in adaptive optics how many actuators you need if you want to correct for this perturbation. So this tells you that this is a, that atmosphere is a really big problem on, on big telescopes. So what happens in an interferometer when you have a phase error? You know that we've you talked about adaptive optics. It causes speckles. It causes all sorts of bad interference that happens. But if you have a simpler system of just two spot, two holes that are smaller than the atmospheric turbulence, this, co this coherence length. So each one of these little apertures are small compared to turbulence, but not the length. What happens is that fringe that we saw gets shifted by the phase delay. If you think about it, this. This uh, situation up here where the, the ray coming on the right is, has an extra delay is actually no different than if the object was coming from over here on the left, right? That it hit one aperture, then it hit the other aperture. It would go through the lens or the imaging system the same way, so it would appear as if it were over here, when really, of course, it's straight overhead, but being perturbed by the atmosphere. So this, on the surface, tells you that a two-element interferometer can, can only look at Fourier amplitudes, because this, this turbulence you can't average out, it's, the statistics are very bad and don't average out very well over time, and so you just have to accept that, take short exposures to freeze this pattern, because if you didn't, it would just be moving around and you know, averaging itself out. You gotta freeze them with short exposures and measure the amplitudes and then calibrate it you know, with a calibrator reference and, and you can measure amplitudes. And that's great for binary stars, that's great for simple models, that's, you can do a lot of science with that. But luckily, there's a trick you can use that was developed by radio interferometers first, which is called the closure phase. Now, one neat thing about this plot I should have emphasized is that the amount of phase shift that this moves is actually independent of the baseline length. It's really a time delay, right? So if you delay this by a half a period, then the interference fringe will be half of a fringe. It doesn't matter how long the baseline is. It's, it's all an angle there. It's all in the, in the relative phase delay. So that means that if you have a triangle of baselines and you measure a fringe between this pair, say one and two, it gets a phase delay. You can write it mathematically quite easily, right? Phase, the observed phase is the true one, which is what you want, but it has this differential phase between two and one. But if you go between the next triangle, two and three, it enters in with the opposite sign. And so if you close a triangle, all these phases, of course, all the individual uh, phases from the atmosphere cancel out, and you're left with this unusual quantity called the closure phase, which is a sum of three Fourier phases. Now, the closure phase is not such an elegant thing by itself. You can't exactly use it easily. You can model fit to it, as you might guess. Um, you can think of it as, as, you know, linear, as linear algebra, right? You want all the individual phases, but you're given some set of, con of combinations that you know, and so you can you have some information, but you can't invert the problem, right? You, there, this matrix is not invertible, but you can um, constrain models. So, let, but we do. There are some properties of the closure phase. Um, from a, from an instrumental point of view, closure phase is great because atmospheric turbulence does not bias your closure phase in one direction more than another. You know, when you're trying to calibrate the amplitude, if you have uh, the scene getting worse or better, it will cause blurring with any kind of finite uh, exposure time that has to get calibrated. Um, and it can, you know, it can be very, the statistics of that can be very non-Gaussian, and so it makes it very difficult to calibrate it. Um, phases, however, are going to be much more even, back, it should be even in both directions, right? 
Like visibility is one-sided. You only get worse. You have your perfect visibility, and then you get amplitude just get worse, and you, just how worse it gets. That's what, why it's an, a weird non-Gaussian distribution. Uh, phases can be either plus or minus, and they're, they're going to be a symmetric distribution guaranteed. And so that means that if you want to average closure quantities, these closure phases, there's really no skew in that distribution. It's intrinsically symmetric, and that's, of course, very powerful. Uh, and so there's a hope, at least, a, a realistic hope, that you could average these measurements like a root in process as opposed to you know, having to average over the seeing time scale and things like this. Um, there, but there are biases that can affect it. Uh, there are dispersion in a finite spectrograph. There's dispersion effects in your beam train that can cause problems. Uh, or when you make your holes too big because you want light, so you want your holes to be big in your, in your aperture mask or in your telescope, there's going to be residual systematic curvature, that, like uncorrected modes in your adaptive optic system or in your optical train. And those very slight you know, turns across an aperture will corrupt your closure phases and, cause you a, and give you, a, at some level, your baseline systematic. So they're not, it's not absolutely perfect. Um, there is an experiment here that uses single-mode fibers. Uh, so as a poster, I'll mention it later. The first project actually tries to put the light into single-mode fibers, which does, at least in principle, correct for these problems. But as you may see on the poster, there's other problems that come up using fibers. So there's, nothing's perfect. Um, in terms of the interpretation, uh, there's a few things you can realize about closure phases. So uh, a symmetric object, as you know, uh, if you put the point of symmetry in the center of your object, then the Fourier transform is an even function, which means there's no sign component. That means, a fa that, means that the phases of any phase you want is 0 or 180. There can't be anything else if you put your point of symmetry in the, point of, in the center. And so that is a you know, that's a robust constraint that the closure phases have to be 0 or 180 for a symmetric object. So for instance, in some areas, just measuring a non-zero closure phase is interesting. It tells you there's a companion, or it tells you there's complexity in your disk, or it tells you something. So in some science areas, you just measure a closure phase. It says it's 30 degrees. You have no idea what it means, but you know it means it's not centrosymmetric. And that will lead you then down a different path of analysis. So it can be a very powerful thing, even just that one little piece of information that, it, that it's a deviation from 0 or 180. Um, another interesting thing about a closure phase is it turns out, because you're combining three terms together, that, they, that this, it's not a what you would call a first order property. It's a third order property in your resolution. And so it means that um, you have to resolve that, quote, asymmetric structure with your baseline. It's not like a photocenter shift. You've probably heard of photocenter shifts, where you have, a, let's say, a faint companion that's a thousand times fainter, but it will shift the centroid of light by one part in a thousand, right? Well, that doesn't work with closure phase. If you're not resolving the separation, the closure phase parts, because it's those combinations, can't partially cancel out in that marginally resolved limit. So you have to resolve it. You need enough resolution to do that. It doesn't work at first order. That may sound like a small thing, but it's, un it's unfortunate for, as you might imagine, for exoplanets where you're trying to get very close to the diffraction limit. Um, and OK, the others are fine. So OK, so let's do aperture masking example. I actually use this as an example for long baseline interferometry. But here, since we're mostly talking about aperture masking, it's even better. So if you have an aperture with two holes, you make an interference pattern. It's just a Fourier transform, but then you square it right, to get the power. And you get the fringes. Oh, here's a 2D now. Then to, do, to extract the information from this, you could fringe fit, what we call right? You could fit those fringes with a model. But what's more powerful, usually, is you do a Fourier transform of this pattern, again, and you get this three peaks. So the zero is the, what we call the DC spike in the center. That tells you how much total light is in your signal. And then the, the plus and the minus frequencies in the Fourier transform is the amplitude of your fringe. It tells you exactly the amplitude of your fringe. And so you see that it's a really nice way of all this light that's spread over your entire chip. Because it's a very simple transfer function, it gets put into just those little dots that you can then go in and, and grab the amplitude. Now with two telescopes, that doesn't seem like a big deal. But we start making it more complicated. Here's three. We see get starting to be this crisscrossing fringes. Now remember, if there's no adaptive optics to freeze the atmosphere, if it's just speckle, these fringes are moving around all the time. And so those spots are just moving, moving around. Um, they're always there, though. They're never disappearing, but they're, all, they're just moving around as the phases change. Um, and you see now more dots. Now, how do you tell which is which? Well, it's, it's actually quite simple. There's a you know, powerful autocorrelation theorem that says that the power spectrum the Fourier transform of a power spectrum is the autocorrelation function. So this is a proof of it. Here's the aperture array. You just autocorrelate that, and you get this. 
over here. And indeed, if you look, this baseline here shows up you know, here. This, these, these upper one triangles show up here and over here. Remember, zero is in the center. And there's a plus and a minus because it's a complex quantity. Uh, you can think of it as a direction of your baseline pointing left to right or pointing right to left. They have the same phase, just the uh, um, opposite sign. OK, so we, we kind of carried this. Uh, during my thesis at, at, at Berkeley with Peter Tuthill and Bill Danchi, we kind of carried this from initial experiments on the William Herschel telescope that was done by Cambridge. We carried it further to the Keck telescope. And this was before there was adaptive optics. So this was really um, uh, one of the only ways to get at um, the diffraction limit at that time. And this was one of the maps that we used. This has 15 different holes in it. Um, now, I, I want to introduce the word non-redundant at this point. So non-redundant aperture masking is what you often hear of, or NRN, non-redundant masking. And this has, to do, this has to do with that the pattern you have is such that the spacing between, the between every aperture is unique. And that is for reasons that you just saw, that that allows you to then use that Fourier transform trick to just pick out a, that unique fringe uh, power in the power spectrum. And it also means also that you don't have interference between two different baselines. Um, imagine if you had a square of apertures. You would get a fringe between this pair, and you'd get a fringe between this other pair, and they would have the same exact fringe frequency, but they'd be totally out of phase with each other. And so they would add together and totally corrupt your closure phase, and it wouldn't work anymore. So you don't, you want, if you want closure phase to work, you would like every pair to be, every uh, baseline to be unique so that you're not corrupted by other, of light from other interference fringes. Uh, yeah, and so you can see that you get a lot of information, right? This is a combinatorial thing. So 15 telescopes, you know, 15 choose two are the number of possible combinations. So that's, you know, 15 times 14 divided by two. So that's, you know, around 100 baselines you get with this. Now you immediately see a downside of this, and that is that this kind of array blocks 90% uh, of the Keck aperture, right? So this was, of course, seems like a bad idea. And you can see that, indeed, the black is where light's going through, not where it's not going through. So it really is a, a drastic reduction in your amount of light. But what you're trading off is the purity of your interference. So if you don't have photons, if photon noise is, is your limit, then you don't want to do this. And you can use what's called speckle interferometry, for instance. Uh, to do a better job. But if you have the photons, and, and your problem is calibration, and a lot of what we're talking about at this meeting is at the limit of where you have the photons, it's a calibration problem, then you want to have the best interference, the purest interference, the best calibration. So this is the standard trade-off. So this is a movie of it, of the Keck data. You see now, instead, of, you, I, I couldn't find a Keck Speckle movie offhand, but you've all seen speckle movies probably if you've seen the AO systems on and off. And you know that the pattern you get with, with an AO system off is a real mess. It's very hard to characterize. It's splodgy. It sometimes looks decent. Sometimes it's totally crazy. It's, it's going up, in, and out. It's doing crazy stuff. And that indeed is your intuition that it's going to be hard to calibrate because it is doing some crazy stuff. Here you actually see visually that this looks much more regular. You know, th this is 110 fringes or whatever all moving around relative to each other, but, in a, but the patterns are regular. And so indeed, when you take your Fourier transform of this, here is the power spectrum of each individual, you know, a seventh of a second frame. And you see each, the location of each peak is, of course, rock solid because it's related to the geometry. It can't move around. It's, the, it's totally fixed by the geometry of your mass, so it doesn't move. And then the amplitude does fluctuate some because of our averaging time isn't, perf isn't zero. Um, but you can see all, every single baseline is visible in every single tiny short exposure. Here's the phases. If you measure phases of the different, of, this is looking at 100 different frames. This is the phase that you measure on, the, on, the three, on three different baselines. And you see that they're just all over between minus 180 and 180. This is indeed because there's no adaptive optics. But when you form the right triangle of the closure phases, you see something that is clustering around zero. And if you were to average that, you would get you know, whatever you get, a few degree error bar. And you can, of course, do this for a few thousand frames. And you get sub-degree error bars on each of those quantities. Um, so I'm going to have a very brief about imaging because just about imaging, I wanted to finish this discussion before we get into aperture masking results and some of the application. But just to remind you that the amount of data you need is just related at the basic level to how much complexity is in your image. Simple objects, in principle, you don't need that much data. 
complex, arbitrarily complex objects, you need a lot of data. So that doesn't have a single answer. It depends on what you're looking at. You can see that the number of phases or baselines you get drastically increases with telescope number. So you know, if you're, the VLA is 27, you get 350 instantaneous baselines, um, while uh, the number of telescopes in ALMA, you get you know, another factor of three. Taro array, uh, which has six telescopes, you get 15. So, so just for reference, the best interferometer that we have on the ground uh, in the in infrared, you get 15 instantaneous ones. Uh, dynamic range is, is related to your precision. So roughly speaking, uh, if you have you know, 100 to 1, uh, sorry, th say 1,000 to 1 precision on your met quantities, then actually that more or less gives you about 1,000 to 1 dynamic range. It kind of is similar to an AO system. It basically takes light that should be reconstructed in the core into some point source, and it spreads it out, analogous to a speckle pattern. It puts it somewhere else in the image, and so you basically get dynamic ranges that are very closely linked to what your precision is. The baselines, range of baselines, as, this is pretty intuitive too. The longest baseline sets your resolution, and the shortest baseline, or sometimes the aperture itself, sets your lowest resolution, which um, may not sound like a problem in most cases, but actually for the long baseline interferometers that we have, there is a field of view problem where, like, if you have a binary star that's at an arc second, that actually won't make it through your interferometer, and it may corrupt, it will partially get through your interferometer and corrupt things, but it won't be fully characterizable because of these limits. And so, um, Anyway, just an issue. Um, and again, so can you get enough data with only a few telescopes? Well, not for aperture masking. They can ha you can easily have 10 apertures, 20 apertures. So um, you, can, you definitely have enough information to image the kind of things we're talking about today for, and is as good as like an ALMA array, or, or not maybe ALMA, but like a VLA array. But for uh, long baseline interferometers, we definitely have a problem where we only have six telescopes, so, or four, or even three, depending on which interferometer. So it's definitely an issue. Um, a quick mention about imagery construction. If this were a longer talk, we would go through more of some of the older techniques, like the clean technique, which is used in radio interferometry even still today. But the modern way to do imagery construction is really more like model fitting. With powerful enough computers, you can treat everything as a what we call the forward problem as opposed to an inverse problem. And so what we do is you basically think of an image as a grid of pixel values. So it's a model, right? I mean, an image is a model, just with a lot of a very regular model with a lot of values in it, right? And so you want to fit that model to your data. And so that's called forward transform instead of an inverse, because you're going to take a hypothetical a hypothesis, an image, candidate image, forward transform it, compare it to your data, and be like, you know, oh, it's not that good. How can I you know, tweak things in my optimization using you know, Markov chain, using any, you know, Lemberg Marquette, whatever method you want, you'll use some method to then uh, converge towards a better solution. But you're going to start with hundreds or thousands of degrees of freedom in, in your fit when you start. But that gives you, a, that automatically tells you there's a problem because I told you usually we don't have thousands and thousands of data points. So how do you do a model fit when you have thousands of free parameters but you only have, you know, 50 data points, say, or whatever you might have? So this is where this term is called a, where you need a regularizer. This is where this is an ill-posed problem. There is not a unique solution. There's also noise. There's finite data. That all this comes into play. And so you couple a chi-squared analysis, which gives you a goodness of fit, with some other thing called the regularizer, which you're also balancing. So usually you want to, for instance, have a regularizer that, say, is smooth, that gives you smooth images, not total crazy speckly images. Or you can, and also you can impose constraints in your process automatically in a forward process like positivity. You, you make sure your image doesn't ever explore negative values, for instance. So you have these kind of tricks to help you along. So entropy is one. I'm not going to talk about entropy because, in fact, it's not really important, the functional form. There's actually more and more regularizers people introduce all the time um, that you can use. There's total variation uh, you might have heard of, or a Tinkanov regularizer, or you know, there's, a, there's more and more every day because, in fact, for certain types of physical problems, you may use a different regularizer because you have different expectations. Like sometimes you don't expect it to be smooth. You expect it to have spots, or you expect there to be bind like a crowded field. You want a bunch of delta functions. You don't want a lot of diffuse emission. So you can actually tune your regularizer to embed the physics that you want. You know, if you don't want extended emission, then you can probably cook up a regularizer that punishes extended emission, and so your image will be consistent with your data, but maximize some expectation of your physics. But it, you know, it's tricky, and you have to look into the details. But this is what the modern imagery construction routines handle. So here's an example uh, with this non-modern aperture masking. We get very good what we call UV coverage. The, 
this baseline plane that where it tells you which baselines you have is called the U and the V plane. And you see here with aperture masking, you can have almost perfect coverage. This is what you see. It just goes down and levels off. So if you were to look at this, you would say, look, there's an extended dust shell, and then you have a star in the center, and you can read off the numbers. And this is, but if you look in two dimensions, you see that it doesn't just go down. It actually has, an, has a structure in, in, in the different position angles. So it's not just like a disk, that a symmetric disk. It has this almost like a spiral structure. And so when you put it into the maximum entropy routine and you do an inversion, again, a forward transform, you start with the delta function and then you let it go towards a solution. You get, you see the iterations going. It starts with the point source. It's slowly improving your chi-squared using the regularizer. And at the end of the day, you get this spiral structure, which was a discovery of these uh, pinwheel nebulae around wolf ray stars, something that because you didn't know before, but you could only see with high resolution imaging. Uh, I just wanted to show that we can do imaging on the, on the bigger arrays now with Chara. Um, my group has been doing a lot of it. I'll just show one result. We have 300 meter baselines that we can combine all six telescopes together simultaneously in the infrared. We use, you know, this is silicon v-grooves and fiber optics, sort of advances from the telecom industry. So this was one of our nicest results um, where you have a, uh, you can image stars, actually the surfaces of stars now. This is only three milli arc seconds across, so this is now you know, 20, 30 times better than can, you can do with a single aperture. And you, uh, here we see a star, maybe with some spots on it. This is a variable star. But at, over time, there was this eclipse, and, you, and actually we saw over time this disk, this opaque disk, pass in front of it and kind of slowly eat away at it till we basically we had an image here of half of a star at one point during the eclipse. So in terms of aperture masking, by this point, through the efforts of people like Peter Tuthill, who's a bit of a proselytizer of aperture masking and has been at various institutes, he's managed to convince um, plenty of people to do aperture masks ar around the world uh, and his students. And so, uh, inf and so aperture masks, it turns out, are very easy to implement because mo any modern infrared detector has both might have aperture wheels to control the, like the LEO aperture or to control the, the uh, thermal emission outside the pupil. They also have filters, very not large number of filter wheels. So you can put an aperture mask, you, you can just put it pretty much any kind of semi-pupil. It doesn't even have to be a perfect pupil, just somewhere in the beam train that acts like a, near a pupil. And so it's quite easy if you have access to the, to the engineer that can put you know, his or her fingers in the doer. If you say, here, I'll make you it. Just tell me the size, I'll give it to you. And so Peter has made a good business building these little aperture masks to, to, to spec and giving them around the world. So, so nowadays they're quite open and you can get them at, you can, Keck of course was, in terms of the large aperture telescopes was the first. We have one in NERC 2, uh, Subaru, VLT has one um, in the infrared and the mid-infrared, Magellan now, Gemini, T-Rex did in mid-infrared, GPI, <laughs> Palomar has been doing experiments, LBT, and even James Webb is going to have an aperture mask as I'll show you a little bit at the end. In terms of interferometers, we've had actually a lot of shutdowns lately as we sort of converge on some of the more powerful uh, rays. So in the US, we have Chara as the longest baseline interferometer. In Europe, you have the VLTI on the big and the, H and the smaller and the larger telescopes. And we have some visible arrays in, in the Navy prototype optical interferometer and SUSE in Australia. So these are all the arrays. If you want really long baseline, you can go to these. Okay, so let's get going here. So here's just some quick applications. So a lot of the planets you saw is are, are so far are planets that are fairly far away. Some of the earliest ones, you know, were fairly far away from the, the speckle cloud that is a residual from your AO system. Now, it may not be, so, okay, so let me just, this is a, this is a slide from Mike Ireland. What I really want to show you is that um, the niche for exoplanets for aperture masking, because we don't have the high contrast, like 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7, that you need to do normal, just naked exoplanets. It's really looking for a special kind of exoplanet, like an accreting exoplanet, or an exoplanet that's super luminous because it's of its young age or because of its accreting, which means you have to look at young star, you have to look in young star regions. It doesn't, it's not going to work around a nearby star, right? And so this is the niche for, now we did an aperture masking, and it's kind of daunting, right? Because 10 AU, um, at a nearby star forming region is 70 milli arc seconds. And you see that's inside all of the techniques you've seen today. Nobody is doing competitive inner working angles of 70 milli arc seconds at 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7 contrast, right? And that's bad news, right? I mean, if you want, a lot of what we've been talking about are young planets. And you see here that none of the systems we, we do can get within even Saturn or Neptune, 
of an analog and a nearby star forming region. And so this is why aperture masking is quite good, is because we really want to look at young planets, but even our best systems on 8-meter telescopes cannot do that. I mean, the coronagraphic spot is bigger than that, right? They literally cannot do that uh, using those techniques. They're just blocked. This is when Jeremy says resolution's not, not the problem, it's contrast. You see, for this part, it really is the problem, is resolution, it's not the contrast. Because the contrast might be easy, it's the resolution in this case. And so, yeah, I don't have to go into that too much, but this is a recent G pi contrast curve. This is only one minute, but you can just see that this, they, they just stop the plot at point two here. You don't even see, of course, inside this, there's a coronavirus spot, so you see nothing. But you see that once you get within around point two arc seconds, your, your contrast is going down to only you know, one part in a thousand, and that's the regime where you can use aperture masking. So there's a perfect handover from coronagraphy to aperture masking right at this level when you're photon noise dominated and you can't do the correction because of resolution. And again, just to really emphasize this, because I, I always find this shocking. I always think I do the math wrong. But you know, that's 30 AU. So just from the beginning, with all these projects, you're throwing away the inner 30 AU of every young star whenever you point G pi or sphere at. I mean, it's shocking, right? Because you think of planets inside 30 AU usually. And so forget it, right? There's nothing, there, you know, you have to, you know, just keep that in mind. It's really shocking. That's right, but it's only a little bit better. But yeah, but just still, keep it in mind. It's really shocking, actually, when you hear talk. You might think you can apply this to even the torus, but you see that you can't. OK, so I, won't, I know I'm running out of time, I think. Four minutes? OK. So one of the big advances that was done after I kind of left this field for a while, I worked a little bit with Jamie Lloyd and Mike Ireland and Peter Tudhill to do the first aperture masking behind an AO system. And what that lets you do is do long integrations. So before with aperture masking, we had to freeze the atmosphere at a seventh of a second. You could only do sort of fifth magnitude. But with an AO system, it acts as what we might call a fringe tracker. And it, let, it freezes the fringes, at least mostly, not perfectly, but mostly. And you can then integrate for you know, a minute, 10 seconds, whatever you want. And then you can go all the way down to whatever, you know, K of 12, 9, down to basically do any YSO you want in the nearby star forming regions. So that really opened up a niche to explore that range. Now, because AO systems are not perfect, the amplitudes of the fringes are being wobbling around because the fringe tracker isn't perfect. So the amplitude information is actually pretty spoiled. But it's this closure phase information which has a no net bias that you can still use. And so when you see aperture masking data, one sort of, one sort of secret is that the visibilities are almost never used because they're too corrupted. It's just the closure phases that are used for that. And that limits it to fairly uh, you know, simple objects like binary stars or exoplanets, not for disks or complicated objects. So this is the this is one of the uh, this is the sort of poster child for this technique is the Lickhausen 15, um, where they look in the idea is they look in transition disks and what you find is sometimes in transition disks you actually find a companion. So aperture masking can find a 10 to 1, 100 to 1 companion very easily. So sometimes these transition disks are not from planet formation but because of a binary star. So aperture masking is first used to just find binary stars, right? Rule out planets. That's actually what it's really good at doing. But occasionally it finds something interesting that could be related to planets. And this was the first one, I think, or one of the first ones that was really obvious. And so here, here's the signal. It's a closure phase signal. It oscillates up and down. It's 0.1 degrees. So that corresponds to a few hundred to one in flux ratio. And uh, there is a transition disk. And this is a transition disk in the millimeter. And inside the transition disk, you see this object that appears in multiple bands. Although in some bands, it's, it's not a point source. It's actually extended along an azimuth. And I won't get into the science behind this, but they've kept monitoring this. And it definitely is there. It's repeated many years. There's evidence that it might be in orbit. There's a lot going on. You can look at the Adam Krauss and Mike Ireland papers that have come out recently. But the, the, but, but the amount of luminosity in the object is much more than just a naked hot star planet. But it has to do with more like maybe the, this very short accretion phase that a Jupiter has to. Uh, um, well, it can just take all that gravitational energy and stay hot, or it can release a bunch of it on its way to forming and have these short bursts of, of energy. And so this is hinting that we ha this is a way that some of that gravitational potential energy is extracted before you have the planet naked by itself. So I think there's, I was interested in your, your Jonathan's talk because if you did a big sample of this, there probably is some clever way to constrain these in a robust way, like where the energy budget is going. Uh, but, but because it's limited resolution, it's ambiguous, what you have. And so you can fit sometimes a point source, like a planet, or you can also put a disk. So this is the imaging site is ambiguous. So some, sometimes people will report something that could be a planet or one of these accreting protoplanets, but it's really a disk. 
And uh, here's a case that looked like an exoplanet, but when we looked at it in two different other wavelengths, it had a totally different position. And so clearly it's not a point source. And so this led to even more complicated, uh, you know, possible, f you know, feeding streams and other complexities in the disk. So we clearly need more information on this. I just won't have time to mention it, but there's an advance called kernel phase that you should really read about. It's one of the biggest advances in the field. Well, I'm way overdue here. Sorry about that. Um, just to say that kernel phase is a way that if you have a very good AO system, you can linearize the phase errors and you actually can use some linear algebra tricks of singular value decomposition to extract quantities that are as good as closure phase but have higher signal to noise uh, for faint sources. And I won't get into that. And we can apply, I'll just mention in words that we can apply these same methods to long baseline interferometry to look for hot Jupiters. And so we, uh, I'll skip all the science background, but just to say that we can look, we can set limits of around 2,000 to 1 today on hot Jupiters using closure phases on long baseline interferometers where the separation is only 1 or 2 milli arc seconds rather than 50. And uh, <laughs> I really went over, sorry. Uh, lastly, and VLTI is doing that. And the last point is that there is that interferometers have a special role in astrometry because they have very long baselines. And so in principle, you can access very fine angles for astrometric wobble. And there'll be some talks about this later. And just to say that interferometers uh, have this have a few candidate extrasolar planets that have been found using astrometry and that there's more work to be done in this space. And I have a poster on an effort I'm doing if you're interested later. So I will end with the summary and sorry I went so long. I got too pedagogical. So thank you very much. Well, you just have, uh, it's just way easier and you have uh, it's just much more throughput, and you can have many more apertures. You know, you can do. Oh, sorry. The question was, what's the advantages of non-redundant masking over using a long baseline interferometer? And so, yeah, the it's just much more practical. You can use existing instruments that are very powerful. It's more sensitive because you have fewer reflections. You can, you know, integrate. You can use the AO system as a fringe track. It's just, it's just very easy. And yeah, so yeah, in principle, you could have an, you could do this all on long baseline interferometers, but with less throughput.